Bill Roundtree is in studios, a financial experts, an entrepreneur, is a speaker, and he also has a, a good backstory, very motivational. Good to see you, Will. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Adam. So I know a little about your backstory, but let's uh, hear it from you, and then we'll move our way toward the present. <laughs> Absolutely. So Will Roundtree, originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, Adam, just like everyone else, I was told, go to school, get good grades, get a good job, house, mm-hmm. 2.5 kids, all that good stuff. Found out that did not work for me. And so uh, went to college, uh, was in my economics class for maybe a semester and a half. And I remember my econ teacher telling me, this information I'm teaching you will not help you to become rich. So I actually dropped out of college at that point. Mm -hmm. Uh, Went into the workforce, started working, was working at a warehouse, thought I was going to retire from there. Uh, Was there for about seven and a half years. And then one day on August 13th, they told us the company was sold to a hedge fund. August 14th, went in, chains were on the door, didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Had dropped out of college, had no real skill set, but... Uh, fortunately, I was actually introduced to something called network marketing in 2003. And so joined network marketing, didn't make any money. But the one thing that it taught me, Adam, was personal development. I actually started reading books like Think and Grow Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it really just taught me how to change my level of thinking. Mm-hmm. And so from there, um, you know, I was working with a gentleman who was teaching me a lot just about business and entrepreneurship. He said, well, we're building a team in Las Vegas. Would you like to go out there? And I'm like, absolutely. Had nothing else really going on. Wasn't making much money in the network marketing organization and didn't have any money personally at the time. So he actually loaned me $500. I took that, moved to Las Vegas and quickly found out entrepreneurship and business is not easy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So got out there, found myself couch surfing, sleeping in my car. Uh, And then I would go to different libraries and Internet cafes and started reading books and going online, started to learn things about credit, about business and learning how money works, uh, who banks loan money to and different strategies and different things like that. And so took that information, applied the practical application to myself, ended up, you know, kind of starting not necessarily a business. I really was just going out educating people on the information because I saw what it had done for me. I was able to get my first vehicle without having to put down money on a car because I always thought you had to put 20, 30 percent down on a car. But when you have great credit, you don't put money down. Was able to purchase a house in 2012, 2013. Coming from Milwaukee, I never even fathomed owning a home, let alone coming from homelessness to being able to purchase a house. And so when I saw with the the, the barometer of where everyone was losing at, it was about understanding how finance worked. And so from there, just started partnering with different realtors, doing free home workshops and seminars, and it just kind of morphed and grew. And I ended up writing my first book, Credit is King, uh, in 2016, and it's actually one of the top selling books on Amazon. And and fast forward, you know, the Cliff Notes version, we're here today. I've traveled the country. I've, you know, three time selling author. I'm a TEDx speaker. I've uh, worked and mentored over 50,000 people uh, in person and virtually. I've helped probably, you know, two, three thousand small and medium sized businesses get access to about four hundred million dollars in capital. I've partnered and licensed my content to different universities. So I've done a lot. Is there, you know. All right. So I come from poor people and there's an aversion to talking about money and to discussing finances. And they didn't even say career. They said job. Definitely. You got to work. You got to get a job. Everyone's got to have a job. Then never heard the word career because right. that was like for other people or somehow doctors and lawyers. But you're not a doctor and you're not I'm a lawyer. Far, so you, you got to get a job, Definitely. you know. And I, I realize a, a lot of it is a mindset. Um, people talk about the haves and the have nots and these people from this side of the tracks don't have what those people have. And I go, it's, it's more of a mentality. Cause I was, I come from white people who were educated, but their mentality was bad right. with money and it was weird and we never discussed it. And I just got a job out of high school and that was it. And I never thought about it. And then I realized it, it's where I come from. Like it, they didn't talk about investments, flourishing, accumulating wealth, generational wealth. It was all just get a job 
and the you know the man's gonna fuck you at some point. Like that was all it was, and he right. does, he's gonna give you as little as possible, and you're screwed. But you try to get a job, and then I realized it. it now I'm thinking about it because I got to go get a colonoscopy in two days. Okay, and I realized there's certain groups that don't get colonoscopies because they don't want it. They don't think about it. They don't right. like it. They don't like the concept of a colonoscopy, Absolutely. right? So they go, a lot of people, in the men in the black community, go, I'm not getting a colonoscopy because I don't want to. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. and, and and it creates a problem because then they, there's colon cancer right. and we didn't diagnose it early enough. And I wonder if it's the same in a weird way with finances, because I feel that way. I felt that way coming from where I come from, not in the black community, but certain communities have it worse than others where they, they almost just don't want to talk about it. Definitely. Or they don't trust it or something, like the colonoscopy. Right. Like they, it needs to be done. They should be doing it. It's healthy and it should be discussed, but it's not. Well, I mean, I grew up the same way. You know, I used to have this thing where I would say, in my family, we didn't discuss finances, money, credit, banking. All we, ta all I was taught was to save money, but you can't save your way out of poverty. Right. And that was something that I learned. And and as I've traveled this country and been working with people for over ten years professionally, the thing that I've learned, Adam, is that the brain only knows patterns. So if we grew up amongst that, where all we knew was, you know, uh, eating syrup sandwiches. At least that's what we ate in my household, or poverty, or you know, however one grew up when it came to the lack of. That's all you know growing up. You don't understand the difference between saving in, in an investment account. You don't understand the difference between uh, an entrepreneur versus getting a job because it's two totally different worlds. Yeah, I used to s describe my family this way. I would say, you guys are in save a nickel mode. I'm in make a buck mode. I like that. And you can save all you want, but if you're just saving nickels, it's not going to add up get out of saving every nickel mode and get into make a buck mode. Like to. meaning don't be a defensive fighter, be an offensive fighter, right. move forward. You're, you're not going to be, you could beat Mike Tyson if you move forward. If you try not to get hit by Mike Tyson, then you're going to get hit <laughs> by Mike Tyson and it's going right. to be a short night. Right. So like be in make a buck mode, which no one in my family ever got into because they were sort of fear based. Right. I realized they didn't, trust themselves or the system or or whatever whatever it was and maybe maybe it was a situation of look they didn't have much money they weren't much good at this and it would have been kind of painful for them to admit that they were essentially failures well i think some of it came from the marketing from banks you mm -hmm. think about banks make money off of you know uh mortgages banks make money off of the backs of people putting their money into savings accounts so if someone puts $100 into the bank, the bank lends out at least 90 of it. And they keep, a, you know, $10 of your money there and, and, and you're making interest off of the least amount of the money that they keep of yours. Whereas someone like yourself or myself, who's an investor, we take that $90 from the bank that we can borrow tax free and we go make more money off of the person who saved the money in the bank. And so there's this conundrum of of the difference of how money works. And I think that's what the biggest issue is. And that's really what my entire mission is to do. To, to, to help people to understand that because in America, especially from a small business standpoint, we're in a very bad position right now financially. Why are we in a bad position financially right now? Well, I think a lot of it is is that you have a segment of individuals who they're going to always know how to play the game. And then there's a segment of people who don't know how to play the game. And so what I, you know, have kind of really just taken my entire career to do is to learn how to play the game. And my game is helping, you know, that kind of help, helping America by fixing small business owners. That's really where everything lies at, because the American dream is really where it's, it's the small business, you know, because uh, amongst having the small business, then that's where people are seeing where their wealth comes from. So whether you have a dry cleaner or you're running a Fortune 500 company, everything else in between, they're, they're struggling. And so what I've done is I've, you know, I'm, I've created this thing called the SPV, which is a small purpose vehicle for uh, assisting small business owners, meet small and medium sized businesses, uh, entrepreneurs and showing them how to isolate their risk 
when it comes to the cash flow, because that's the number one issue with small business owners. It's a lack of cash flow. And so if you have a person who is trying to become an entrepreneur, but they have their regular life expenses, they're essentially financing not only their life, but their business. And one of them is going to suffer. But it's because there's a lack of information, a lack of strategy, a lack of the concepts of how money works, because a person will say, well, let me try to save $20,000 to start this business, not knowing that you can start an S, uh, a SPV, again, a special purpose vehicle, which is an entity solely used to isolate your financial risk, where I can now go to the bank and borrow the 20000 And so essentially banks want to lend to corporations. And so we got to learn how to separate ourselves. It feels to me like there's a lack of this being taught at schools. I certainly didn't learn anything about this. At, That's why I dropped out of college. The they didn't schools. teach me. But economics. certainly before that, just nothing. I didn't go to college, but at junior high, high school, right. not discussed. Um, I, I think there's a problem. And I've, I've had this theory, which is it's going to be hard to be taught the entrepreneurial spirit by people who don't have the entrepreneur spirit <laughs> because they're high school teachers, right. you know what I mean? And, and school teachers, everyone likes to talk like they're heroes, but all right, some of them are maybe, but they're basically people who made a deal. And the deal was, I'm not going to work in the private sector. I'm not going to go out into the open market right. and uh, may the highest bidder win. I instead, I'm going to take a job that guarantees me $59,000 a year for the rest of my life. I can't get fired and I never have to work in summers. And I get a ton of time off for spring break and winter break. And so you are de facto being taught by people who have dropped out of the system, essentially. Now, they're employed right. and they pay taxes and they're citizens and everything like that. But don't expect that person to try to talk to you that person's not Mark Cuban. That person's <laughs> a person that's taking $59,000 a year and security versus the unknown of hanging your own shingle and seeing which way the wind's blowing out there because you could go bankrupt, you know, and you, or you could have riches. But they said, no, I'm going to take this Correct. job. Why would those people be any good at teaching anybody the entrepreneurial spirit? They're the last of the entre they're, they're as far away from entrepreneurial as you can get in our society. So maybe we're expecting too much. Also, they're not interested in that anymore. And I don't know what they, I'm not sure who figures out the curriculum, but it's something that should be discussed and <laughs> taught agree. and it never, it just isn't. I agree. Also, when you hear about the union bosses and the crazy women that run the you know the, the the school union and the districts and stuff they don't seem interested in any of this at all right. and as a matter of fact they don't like people who do all this stuff they don't even like vouchers and private schools they don't want any of this they want big union government boom we're here we vote We'll vote in the governor of California. He'll do what we want, and we'll sit on our asses and get paid the most we can get paid for the least amount of work. Right. So I don't know. We shouldn't be surprised that these people aren't teaching this to our young kids. No, I, I definitely agree. But here's what I'll say what separates me and why I'll say what makes me the, the SPV guy, Adam. Is, is that I'm teaching people how to structure their SPV solely for the purpose of real estate. Mm -hmm. So now we're isolating their risk because here's the thing that I'm always saying to people. What is the one thing that everybody has to do? They got to live somewhere. Right. And a part of the American dream is home ownership. So now we're able to capture a wider audience of a net of individual who all wants to have some form of home ownership because that also is what helps to, to, to close that, that wealth gap amongst individuals, business owners, and, and everything else in between. And so if I can show them how to mitigate their risk through the structure of the SPV, and we're going to have the bank 
put up the bulk of the money for that on both sides of it, it mitigates the risk from that school teacher, from that union worker. And because I, I do believe deep down inside, most people want to have a quote unquote side hustle or a, a small business because that's one of the ways they're able to supplement their income. But everybody's went out there. They've tried everything. But the one thing that most people want to try, but they have very little knowledge about because of the risk factor that they think or that they assume that's out there is through real estate. And that's what I'm doing is showing people how to uh, create these SPV. Well, I help them create the SPVs through real estate to essentially give them automatic cash flow. What is the uh, interest rates are still pretty high, right? So let's. Uh, I'll answer that question, but I want to sh- I want to give it to you from a different <laughs> viewpoint. So as an entrepreneur, I'm more focused on my return. So the interest rate is only, a, a, you know, a calculation that helps me to predetermine what my ROI is going to be. Mm-hmm. So f- so what we typically do, because we're setting people up with an SPV as a corporation, Banks only banks want to lend to corporations. I always say there's a loophole in the banking system that separates the individual from their you know corporation to where the bank is almost guaranteed to lend to them. Mm-hmm. So if we go and get a commercial loan on that SPV, the average interest rate is going to come in, especially with the lenders that you know we 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 source out. You're going to come in at about nine or ten percent. Which, if you go back and look, historically, in the 80s and 70s, if you had great credit, interest rates were 12 and 13 yeah. percent. So historically, they're still lower. But now, instead of living in a house at a 9 percent interest rate, that's not making you any money. What we're saying is, is hey, we're going to take that 9 or 10 percent interest rate and we're going to help you to make money from it. So now the rent or the income from that property is going to service the debt on that property Plus, whatever you make in between is going to be your net profits. So we're showing people from a business standpoint on how to structure these. Yeah. Generational wealth, property, it's just, you know, it's I'm thinking about my own family of origin (laughs) and shaking my head, shaking my head because um, they, they didn't do a good job of that. You know, the, the generation before you. Yeah. Well, my grandmother bought two houses in the valley okay. for like ten thousand dollars, like in the 50s. Right. But her daughter lived in one of them as an adult for free. That, didn't, that can didn't, cause a problem. Didn't pay rent. And then her daughter never bought a house because she was living in her grandma's free house. Right. <laughs> with me. And uh, then. Uh, at some point, grandma died, and then my mom, as her daughter, moved into her house and uh, sold the other house that got bulldozed, and then moved into a grandma's other house, and then she died, my mom, and now the house is owned by my stepdad. So I don't know what's going to become of it, but right. it's not very generational wealth passy downy. I, you know? I, I, I agree. And uh, I, however, have like warehouses and things like that. Right. And uh, I will I will tell you this. I know nothing about finance or, and or real estate, but I'm telling you, buy a warehouse, man. Buy a warehouse. It only goes up. You can always rent it out. Right. Uh, it is a good business warehouses and or you'll use the hell out of it like right. i've had this warehouse for 20 years i come here every day right you know like for me there's an element of uh you know investment is great and rental property you know all that income property it's all good uh but if you're gonna buy something use it you know what i mean like if you buy a boat and you never go out right. on it then i don't know what your plan is but to me there's an element of i i want to use this thing and I've just used the hell out of every warehouse I ever got. But what would you say to somebody who was just listening, who just went, okay, I used to say this to people all the time. I go, look, they go, when's the best time to buy a house I, I, or property or anything? I'd, I'd say the second you can do it. The second, the second you can do it, do it. And they'd go, well, maybe it's not a good time, you know, whatever. I'd go, just do it. You'll figure it out, but you'll have something. Uh, and and by the way, when you have something, right, you buy a warehouse, 
and you pay 500 grand for a warehouse and the warehouse is worth $3 million, then you get to go to the bank and go, I need a loan. And they go, what do you got? And I go, well, well I got, got $2.5 million yeah. worth of equity in a warehouse right. that I paid 500 grand for, and they will give you a loan. So, so, so essentially, we're in the same ballpark, Adam. But here, here's where I'm. Here's where the 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 average entrepreneur, average small business owner. Because let's look at it this way: nine out of ten small businesses fail. Uh-huh. And so, why is that? Because they lack cash flow. And when you think about that business that is failing, they're struggling to stay open. They have nothing that they can use to stabilize their their revenues. So even from the standpoint of you having a warehouse, if you're running a business out of the warehouse, but you own the warehouse, at least you can borrow against the asset completely tax free to stabilize that actual business. Someone who has a dry cleaner, someone who has a bakery, a restaurant, they don't have that. You know, you think Mm -hmm. about the McDonald's franchise. They're really a real estate company. Mm -hmm. What Ray Kroc did was is he set up SPVs and said, hey, if you want to buy a McDonald's franchise, we're going to own the building and you got to rent from us. So now they've McDonald's has mitigated their risks. So now it doesn't matter how many uh, burgers they sell or milkshakes because they know that that franchise owner has to pay that rent every single month. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, is so we're going to take that small business owner who may be struggling, who's uh, lacking cash flow, who's lacking operating capital, and we're going to say, hey, let's set up an SPV. Uh, We can eventually get to the warehouse, but let's go and buy some some single-family homes, some multifamilies, because at least we can go and actually create the SPV, go and get uh, lines of credit from the bank, and then what the bank is going to do, they're going to cover 80%. We're going to use the credit that we uh, helped you, helped your SPV establish uh, to, to cover your soft costs or the 20% down payment. So now it costs you nothing to get into that property. The tenant is going to service the debt, which then in turn, you can utilize that cash flow to pour back into your failing business or your struggling business or the business you're trying to get off the ground. And then in the event, if you are in a, you know, a situation where the sky is falling or whatever the case may be, you can go back and borrow against those assets or that portfolio going back to your scenario about borrowing against the the warehouse and you can do that tax free. And so this gives them an opportunity to mitigate their risk because, again, that small business owner, they may not be able to operate out of that warehouse. What is the uh, what are some of the burgeoning markets? Where are some good places to To pick up? Yeah, because, you know, you're out here in SoCal and there's nothing absolutely in the neighborhood (laughs) under one point five million that you can even think about. Definitely. And. It is really, without exaggeration, you know, back to the school teachers making $59,000 a year and her husband works for Home Depot and he makes $74,000 a year. And you're looking at places you wouldn't you wouldn't have your worst enemy spend the night in some of these places that are a million dollars. Correct. Uh, and so now it's going to take 1.8 million bucks for you to get into something semi decent, yeah. not not even luxurious or anything. Of that, so. And you need 20 percent of two million bucks, so you got 400 grand laying around. I don't know who does that. You work at Home Depot. You're a school teacher. Right. How how are you going to pull this off right. in Glendale, Burbank, you know, right. Pasadena? But maybe there's places in Prim, Nevada. Or woodwork. Right. So so here's the thing, Adam. I've broken this down to a science. And so a part of my REI 90 program where we help people to set up these SPVs, uh, we eliminate all of the guesswork. We even tell you what markets to go into. And so what I've done is I've calculated that if you can find properties that are about 150000 and below, they will always cash flow. Mm-hmm. That actually rhymes. Yeah. So 150000 and below, they'll always cash flow. Well, where do they have those properties? So I've been pointing out the Midwest. I actually pulled a report and pulled 20 cities, not states, but 20 cities inside the Midwest. And there's over 5,500 properties that are for sale that are $100,000 and below. And wow. I didn't even do all of the major cities. So I'm looking in places like Detroit, where it's 1,100 properties under 100 grand. I'm looking in places like St. Louis, where it's 531. I'm looking in places like uh, Columbus, 
the in uh, the uh-huh. South Carolina. So mm-hmm. there's places all across the U.S. And and I show people how to not only go and look for these properties, but also how to source them. But then because I'm helping them structure it like a business, we're help. We're also giving them all of the resources that they need. So understanding that you literally could still be running your business out here in Southern California, and we're helping you to build a real estate portfolio in a city like a Milwaukee, Wisconsin, because we've helped you to establish a a team. You have a real estate team, so you got your property managers. They have access to contractors. We have your home inspectors. We have the bank lenders. So we literally are help essentially almost creating you a franchise within the real estate and the SPV is going to own your real estate franchise. Um, I heard there's deals out there for like first time home buyers with, you know, reasonable rates and, and help with the down. And it's got to be under, I don't know, $750,000 or some version of that. Um, you know, too old for that. But they're out there. There, there. Are there things you can utilize that the government basically provides and says, uh, look, if you're a first-time buyer, and we want to incentivize you to go out here and do this, so we're going to make some attractive deals yeah, for so you. Yeah, so the first-time home buyer is really a marketing campaign. And so essentially how that works, because, again, I'm speaking to the business owner. I'm speaking mm-hmm. to this from a business standpoint. Now, can you use the quote-unquote First time home buyer strategy? Yes, there's something called house hacking where you can go and get into a property, put down 3.5%. But here's the thing, Adam, I would never do that as an investor for a single family home. Because again, we're utilizing the real estate to be purchased through the SPV to make you money. Mm-hmm. If you're utilizing your, you know, first time home buyers down strategy to get into a property and it's not making you no money. You've kind of, you know, it's 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 a contradiction of what the strategy is for. Mm -hmm. The only way I would recommend that is if it's a multifamily. So now you can go and get a, uh, you know, a a, a home putting down three point five percent down and you can rent out two to excuse me, one to three of the units, depending if it's a two family, three or four, because they will qualify under the FHA guidelines and you can live in one unit and rent the other three out. But. The, the strategy that I'm really focusing on is, is so we're going to set up your SPV. We're going to go and make sure that your business is bank compliant. And then we're going to go to the bank and get you lines of credit because the loophole in the banking system that a lot of people may or may not know, I can set you up a brand new SPV entity right now today, Adam, and without having to show much proof of income because the bank is going to lend on projected and household income and household revenue, I can take you to several banks here in North America or here just in Southern California and do a process called credit stacking, where essentially we're just going to leverage debt to get into that property. And so now a person may say, well, why would I use debt to get into the property? Well, because that's how most successful real estate investors do. They leverage debt. It's no different than a, 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 a hedge fund or a money manager. Instead of soliciting and begging my friends, family, and relatives for 10 grand, I'm going to go to the bank and they're going to be my investors because with the SPV, again, because it's a business entity, banks want to lend to that. And I'm backing it with real estate. So going back to my uh, breakdown of my calculation. I know for every hundred thousand dollars, only need twenty five thousand dollars down. So I know I can get the twenty five thousand from lines of credit, and I already know. And then as a brand new business, I can get it at a zero percent interest for six to eighteen months, depending on the introductory rate from that bank. Well, the hundred thousand is only going to cost me about six hundred and eighty bucks a month. Let's just call it seven hundred which is the mortgage at a 9% interest rate under my SPV. The credit card debt on the 25000 may cost me 300 Well, I put that together, we're at about $900 a month. Well, in most of the properties in middle of America where we're showing people, the average mortgage is $1,500 in North America. Mm-hmm. So I'm not only covering my debt servicing, but now I'm getting a two to $300 net profit every single month. And all I'm going to do is compound that and do that as many times as I can because it's not costing Will Roundtree any money. I have a uh, final philosophical question for you. Yes, sir. I have this theory. I've had it for a little while that if Trump becomes president 
financially will go, oh, good, we got a guy in there who cares about this stuff, and w- things will open up. There'll be a philosophical Definitely. change is the way I think of it. I don't have any data. I don't have any numbers. I don't have anything other than a feeling that people will go, okay, gas prices are going to come down. He's going to be work with inflation. Maybe, maybe you'll save a little on taxes, but people will be more willing to go, all right, let's go. Let's, let's get, let's crank it up financially because Biden didn't feel like he was helpful Correct. in that, in that department. So I wonder if, again, things aren't going to change overnight, but it's going to be more of a philosophical change where business people went, okay, now we got our guy, so let's go. I, but I don't know what your head on it is. Well, here's the thing. What I'm teaching, Adam, through these SPVs, it really doesn't matter who's in office. Mm-hmm. Because the only thing that will be impacted is, well, here's what we do know. They've already came out, come out and said that in September they want to cut the rates. The feds want to cut the rates. Right. If that happens, housing market is going to go haywire because prices are going to go back up because there's still a housing shortage significantly mm-hmm. in the United States. But because we're playing the game from a business standpoint, essentially all that means is that money will get cheaper. Mm -hmm. So all I'm doing is trying to educate and teach people how to play the game, no matter who's in office. But what's going to happen is, is it opens up more opportunity for individuals who know how to play the SPV game because now the money is cheaper. So imagine being able to set up five SPVs, going to the bank and getting a line of credit for each one of them for one hundred thousand. Now I can go out there and buy five properties and none of it cost me anything out of my pocket. So all it does, you know, it just opens up the the floodgates for people to get access to cheaper money. But they have to know how to play the game the right way. And that's what I'm doing. What do you think they're going to lower them to? Every they're kind of thinking maybe around like four percent. I don't think it'll get to three or two again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if the money does get cheaper, you know, when it comes to housing, it just makes it easier for us who already know how to play the game to get access to cheaper money, because that's really the name of the game. Well, where should people go if they want to learn more about this, Will? So they can follow me across all social media platforms at Mr. That's M-R, Will Roundtree. Uh, also, my uh, three books are on uh, Amazon. I also have an audio version for, for two of them as well. And, of course, I have a YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Uh, they can catch me. And also possibly in a city near them. I've been traveling the country for the past seven years, working with different individuals from banks to colleges and, you know, and, and on different podcast circuits, talking to them about the SPV. Because I'm, I'm the guy that's out here really pushing people to get in position the right way to where it's almost impossible for them to fail when they have the right structure. Uh, Will Roundtree. Yes, sir. Thanks for joining us. It was my pleasure. And thanks Adam. for doing what you're doing. I, 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 I feel like um, I missed out on that, but I don't want other people to miss out on. You it. still have time. I heard you have a black card. I do. See, we can we can set you up some SPVs. <laughs> 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 All right, well, we'll talk card. off the air. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to be in Vegas coming up August 8th doing stand-up. If you're going to be back in Vegas. Yes, I will. Will, you can come by and come by mm-hmm. Kimmel's Club and watch a little stand-up. Come say hello. Uh, I'm going to be at the uh, Automobile Museum in Reno with Patrick Warburton on the 9th doing stand-up out there as well with my Paul Newman car collection. So, Will, if you're around, come say hi on the 8th. Over at uh, Jimmy's Club. Till next time, I'm for uh, Will Roundtree and Jason Mayhem Miller and Eric Roberts saying mahalo. <laughs>